on the back of the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place that in the, uh, in the collection plate a little bit later in the service. And if you have any prayer requests, please indicate that as well. Again, just thanks for being here. Um, I know that uh, you, you could have been anywhere you wanted to be this morning, and we're grateful you chose to be here. If there's anything we can do uh, as a church, I hope you'll let us know. I will tell you that we do not have all the answers. If you're looking for a church that has all the answers, wrong place. We got a lot of great questions, though. So if you have them too, let's sit down together and talk about them. Maybe we can help each other out. Just glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Hey, I want to welcome a couple of new members. Uh, first of all, uh, Stacy McCarty. Stacy, uh, could you stand up, please? You guys give her a hand. Welcome, Stacy. Glad you're here. Stacy's what happens when you invite people to come to worship with you. Bunny Brooks had been inviting Stacy, and here she is, and so we're glad about that. And then Nora Hawkins. Nora, where are you? Nora, right here. Welcome, Nora. Glad you're here. <laughs> Nora's what happens when somebody shows up and says, put me to work. And so we, and she's, she's been great. So we're, we're, we're blessed to have these folks. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to talk to you about how we receive new members. Just glad you're here. Hey, yesterday, uh, 11 o'clock, 11th day of the 11th month, big day, because we remember that there are a lot of men and women who were willing to put it all on the line so that we could enjoy freedom and so that others could enjoy freedom. 
It's an odd day for us as Christians because, first of all, we, we do not love war. Uh, we, we love the Prince of Peace. But we do love men and women who are willing to serve their country and sacrifice themselves for us. If you're a vet or, or even, even serving right now, would you just stand so that we can say thank you and acknowledge you for your service and appreciate you. Please stand. Thank you. Thank you. Last week, uh, somewhere in this time frame in Texas, there was a group of people, not very different from us, who had gathered to worship God, and in just a few minutes, a gunman had walked into their church building and killed 26 of them. A terrifying, awful kind of thing to think about. Um, I will tell you that we met this week and are reviewing our security procedures. You'll hear more about that a little bit later on. We have an officer in here with us this morning, and so we feel very safe. But we do want to remember those folks in Texas. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then we're going to continue with our service. Caleb and Ashley Gendron, our youth ministers, are going to start us off with a scripture reading after the prayer. You guys can come on up as we pray. Let's bow together as we remember those folks in Texas. Father, we would just as soon um, the series that we're in right now not be so relevant. But even on the Sunday that we began talking about evil in the world, evil asserted itself. And it did it in a church building among people who had gathered to worship you. And we confess to you that there are times that we just struggle with that cold, hard reality. That we just don't understand it. And, and that while there may be logical explanations Often they are not emotionally satisfying and we are left with this sort of sp huge spiritual question mark. Well, why? And how long? And what next? And yet we are gathered here this morning to worship you afraid but not afraid because we know that this is not all there is and that no matter what, the core of our faith is an empty tomb and so death has been defeated and that there is nothing anybody can do to us that you cannot undo. We look forward to the time when all the sad things will become untrue. Between now and then, we ask you to give us courage and peace and help us to share the, the good news of Jesus with everybody so that everybody can know that peace and have that courage and experience that hope. And Father, thank you for letting us be honest. As we hear your word now, may it speak to us. May it speak to us in our doubt. May it speak to us in our trust. May it speak to us in our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is from Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I, almost, I was almost gone. For I envied the proud. When I saw them prosper despite their wickedness, they seemed to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like someone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride they speak. They seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so the people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What does God know? They ask. Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease with their riches and multiply while their riches multiply, did I keep my pure heart for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper. But what a difficult task it is. 
Then I went to your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over a cliff to destruction. In an instant they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. Then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you, yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. God is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroyed those who abandoned you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Let's stand together. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne. Oh 
just a few moments we're going to participate together in uh, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper where we're going to remember what Jesus did for us at the cross on the death burial and resurrection of our Lord we're going to do that by taking some cracker and a little bit of juice that will remind us of the body that he sacrificed and the blood that we shed before we do that um, Jody mentioned our series that he is taking us through that we started last week the problem if God is good why is the world so bad and last week uh, Lee Potts shared with us a little bit of his story Jody asked if I would share a little bit of our family's story this week um, and I'm going to do that um, as I begin it I, I just want to acknowledge I know all of us sitting in this room are in different places. And your story is different than mine. But in many respects, our experiences are shared because this world comes with pain and with struggle at some point. And so our paths are different, and yet there is a commonality that exists. And so it is good, I think, for us to be able to share that together. And so um, I'm going to do that a little bit this morning before we have our communion. Many of you know our daughter, Megan, and many of you have prayed for her nonstop for the last six years, uh, something for which we are eternally grateful. Megan, uh, for, for those of you that have been praying, her story is well known, but for some of you in our audience, you may, you may not know that, so I want to give you a little bit of background, and then I'd like to share something that she wrote, if I may do that. Megan and her twin sister Morgan um, went off to college together in the fall of 2010. They were roommates at Harding University. But during her freshman year, uh, Megan developed mono, uh, which is not altogether uncommon for college students, but hers was a particularly difficult struggle. And well into her sophomore year, um, she just couldn't seem to recover, and her condition worsened. 
Her health continued to decline to the point that she was unable to return to school for her junior year, which is in, was in the fall of 2012, two years later. She began to develop uh, some worsening and, and um, seemingly unrelated symptoms that included, among others, severe pain uh, whenever she eats or drinks anything except water. Uh, extremely low blood pressure, very high heart rate, uh, prolonged and severe headaches, deteriorating balance, uh, blurred vision. And as her symptoms increased in severity, her strength deteriorated. And eventually she became confined uh, to bed for much of the day, where, where she remains even to this day. And we began to seek medical help uh, anywhere we could find it. And so over the next three years, we made a half a dozen trips to the Mayo Clinic in uh, Minnesota, seven trips to a neurosurgeon in New York. Uh, we visited countless daughters, uh, doctors I'm sorry, from Birmingham to Nashville and from Atlanta to Baltimore. And although the doctors suspect that Megan's condition is likely an autonomic nervous system disorder that uh, is impacting a lot of her systems, real answers and effective treatment have been elusive. So two years ago, uh, Megan underwent a brain surgery in an effort to correct some of the issues that had been causing these symptoms. She did experience some short-term relief, but unfortunately, in just a few weeks, her symptoms returned, now accompanied by a severe and constant headache. Three more surgeries followed, but her symptoms only worsened, and so despite being hopeful that her body would begin to recover over time, she has seen no real improvement over the last two years. The truth is that after almost six years of searching and struggling, we're really no better off than we were when we started, and that's a hard truth. Despite the difficulty of the struggle, though, I will tell you that our family has experienced God's grace in remarkable ways over the last six years. And Megan has been able to experience and to share with others an unshakable faith in our loving God. Just a couple of months ago, um, Megan received one of those Facebook notifications. Do you guys get these? It, it's like an anniversary thing where a picture pops up and says, hey, this was going on two years ago. <laughs> a lot of times that's a great memory. Um, in this case, not so much. The picture of her going in for that first brain surgery two years earlier came up. This was back in early September. And so she posted something in response to that picture. And I just thought I'd share that with you if that's okay. These are her words. I can't quite wrap my mind around the fact that this was two years ago today. Two years since I began the journey of undergoing four brain surgeries in five months. Two years of desperation, heartache, more MRIs, lumbar punctures, and doctors than I can count. Two years of an unexplainable headache every second of every day. Two years of having rods, plates, and screws in my head and neck, and the mind-numbing constant pain that they bring. Two years since my hopes and heart were completely shattered. But two years of a new perspective. Two years of God still being God, and his plans still being for my good and his glory. Two years of having to choose Lamentations 321, which says, yet I still dare to hope. Two years ago, today and the entire month of September held some of the most traumatic, precious, terrifying, painful, hopeful, joyful, and devastating moments of my life. Life looks so very different today than I hoped it would, yet what remains is an unwavering hope in God's promises and purposes and tremendous gratitude. Not in spite of the pain, but because of it. Today, I'm thanking God, I'm remembering, I'm celebrating, I'm grieving, and I'm still daring to hope that what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. That last sentence is... Um, The last sentence is out of Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Uh, many of you wear one of these reminder bands that I wear, which has that verse inscribed on it, and then it says, hashtag pray for Megan. 
it's also the same section of scripture that Lee shared with us last week that meant so much to him in his journey. I think what we're about to do right now is such a great reminder of the hope that we share. And it's not a hope in our present circumstances, because if that was our hope, then we would be disappointed indeed very often. But it is an eternal hope that looks beyond our struggles and our pain. And it's a real hope. It's also a reminder to me that God not only understands our pain, he has experienced that pain. He sent his son to die for us to take care of our sin problem that we could not take care of, and ultimately to restore and redeem this broken world. We have so many reminders, and I know you have them in your life, of of how broken this world is. And yet this morning, it's important that we remember the eternal hope that we share. And so as we eat this bread and drink this cup together, we're going to do that. Let's pray together. Our Father, as uh, as we join together in this communion, we... We just say thank you. Father, we know that that we live in a broken world. It it does not take us long to look around and see the pain that is in our own lives and in the lives of others. And yet, and yet, Father, you, you came to this earth. You sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins and to experience that ultimate pain. And so as we take this bread this morning, we remember the body of our Savior, and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we do need you, and we just acknowledge this morning, um, we need you every hour, every minute of every day. And as we drink this cup together, we're just reminded of how you have poured out yourself for us. 
We thank you for Jesus and for his blood that washes away our sins, that redeems us and reconciles us to you, and that, Father, gives us a hope that is beyond this world. As we drink it together, we, we remember and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Your sin runs deep, your grace is more, your grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, your holiness is Christ in Todd, thank you for sharing uh, that powerful testimony. We appreciate that. November is um, National Adoption Awareness Month. November 18th, next week, is uh, National Adoption Day. When we talk about pain and suffering in the world, very often, in fact, almost inevitably, the, the most vulnerable victims are children. And so it makes sense that we would want to focus on that for, for just a little bit, uh, especially given the, the correspondence with the, uh, the month. Churches of Christ 
have been involved in reaching out to children for, for decades. Uh, there are over 100,000 children in foster care right now around the country, as, uh, as I understand it. And one of the primary means by which we have done that is through an organization called Agape. This is Danny Holmes, who is the director of North Alabama Agape. Would you please welcome Danny and his wife, Amy, right over here. Glad to have you guys. Danny, the uh, adoption's a big deal to this church because we've, a lot of us have been adopted. A lot of us are adoptive parents or adoptive grandparents, and so it's a big deal to us. Many of us know about Agape, but in case some of our folks don't, can you kind of give us kind of a general idea about what you guys do and what you're all about? Sure. Uh, interestingly, today is Orphan Sunday uh, across our nation and around our world, and we recognize today the need for assistance in adoptive care, in foster care, in child care of orphans. Uh, today, uh, I will tell you, Agape is uh, particularly involved in adoption and foster care. That's really our strong suit. Uh, we will each year do uh, maybe adoptions that would count uh, 10. Uh, some of those are DHR, some of those are private placement. DHR. And Department of Human Resources. Thank you. Those are the children who have been taken away from their families mm. because of abuse or neglect. Uh, our number one goal is to try to get that child back in their family because just like you, we realize God wants children to be raised by their parents mm -hmm. so long as their parents can do that in a safe and stable way. Right. Uh, foster care-wise, uh, we will serve a good number of children. Today, I will tell you, and may steal some thunder from another question, but today I'll tell you we have 61 children in care in, at Agape in our foster homes, and we also have about 117 so far this year. And so we serve a number of children. We also work with birth mothers who are just looking for the answers. Uh, they end up pregnant. They don't know what to do. They are lost. And so we are there simply to provide information and resources. This is a great, let me just add something right here. This is a thing that is really important just to me personally, that we, we Christians talk about abortion and we, we oppose it and we say that this is wrong. There are alternatives and we need to be stand up and step up and provide those alternatives. And you guys are just one, one place to go for that. You're exactly right, Jody. And one of the things that we talk about is there's a difference in being pro-life and being pro-birth. Mm. Many of us find ourselves advocating on the part of pro-birth, and we would demand that the abortion laws be turned over. We would ask that the Supreme Court make new laws for the land, and yet when given the opportunity, we fail to realize that means that someone, the church, has to step up to be pro-life as well and to help that mother have those options that she needs. If we're going if, if to take children out of homes, if we're going to take children away from mothers who can't raise them, then there has to be an answer if we're going to change the laws we, of the land. We have to step up. We have to step That's up. That's absolutely right. 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 Now, uh, this just popped into my head. Do you guys uh, do any state funding, or is it all uh, donations and, and support from churches? In terms of our funding, about 75% is funding from churches and individuals, about 15% is based on fees for services, adoptions, right. and that sort of thing. And then the other 10% is kind of a miscellaneous hodgepodge, but your question is really spot on because not a dime comes to Agape directly from the government. We do have one social worker who works with an, a program, a collaborative program with Child Haven and with Children's Aid from Birmingham where we go in proactively into homes. DHR says this home is about to blow apart. We need help. And we'll go into that home, send a social worker in, and try to keep that home together. Sometimes it's matters of safety. Other times it's matters of safety, yes, drugs and alcohol and other things. We'll work with those parents to try to make sure they can keep that home together. Let me tell you a quick statistic on that. If a family loses a child, statistically, there's about a 40 to 50% chance they'll ever get that child back mm. into their home. Mm. If we're allowed to go in proactively and to help, there's about an 82 to 85% oh, wow. chance that that child is going to stay in the home of either that parent or a kin, a relative. That's awesome. And so that's incredible. Many of us would say, why doesn't the government just pay for that to happen all the time, <laughs> right? <laughs> Difference is a foster family, not agape. Agape gets zero dollars for every foster child in our care, including reimbursement of expenses. 
we still go out and we do those visits. We keep the family licensed. We do all those things that are expected of us. DHR and the state does nothing in terms of even reimbursement of our expenses. But as far as the foster family, they get $14.70 a day. Mm. I want you to think about that. That's less than $450 a month. Over the course of the year, that's about $5,000. Could you possibly raise a growing child for $5,000 a year? Mm. People don't get into foster care to get rich. But that $14.70 a day seems like a, a lot, a lot less, when it's compared to what DHR might pay us mm -hmm. to go in proactively, $60 a day on average for that. Yeah. But let me tell you, if you go ahead and you take a child today and you get them in that $60 rate and we can put them in a safe and stable home for the rest of their lives, 82% of those children, think about what you say, serve or save over the $14.70 mm. that you're going to pay for a child from the time they're removed from their home until they're age 18. And then add on the number of children who end up, because they've been lost to their own family, they go into the penal system, mm -hmm. and we're paying for them to live a life in prison as well. Yeah. Something about that just doesn't add up. Yeah. And so we, that's one of the reasons we appreciate what you guys do and the fact that we can be involved in that. Now, some of us would, would probably be great foster families. Others of us, because of age or health reasons or whatever, may not be. What, if we're not able to be a foster family, what can we do to help you guys? We have several opportunities for people to help us. Number one would be a, a program we call Fostering Friendships. Uh, fostering Friendships is basically you might take a family and to say, I realize how difficult it is to be a foster family. And you guys have had some foster families, and you can talk to them and just ask. So, well, you know, what was it like? When you realize that, you may be able to say, one night a month I could take a dinner to this family. Mm -hmm. One night a month maybe I'll take over a board game or a movie and coupons for pizza and help them that way. It's just a one time a month type program that we go in and do something special for our foster families to try to help them to alleviate a little of that stress, a little of that burden that they're sacrificing to really be parents to those children. Another thing that you can do, uh, you know we have a Christmas program coming up, we take care of our kids, mm -hmm. uh, that's huge for us. Uh, we make sure that each child, each foster child has about $200 worth of gifts. That's a really important thing for us. Now, we want those foster children to be raised in as normal of a relationship as they can family-wise and tradition-wise. And so Christmas is really, really important. Maybe you'd be able to help us with those gifts. We need people to help us wrap those gifts. It's amazing how many gifts 60 foster children need at $200 per child. Someone has to wrap those gifts. Yep. I'm going to tell you, my fingers have more paper cuts. <laughs> We also need people to do little things that just seem very silly. For instance, if you guys gave us money, and you do, through your church you do, if you show up at Agape and we have a beautifully manicured front lawn and then the flower beds are immaculate, you may wonder how much did they spend on that. We pay to have our lawn mowed about once, maybe twice a month in the middle of the summer. If you walk in and you see my flower beds, you're going to think to yourself, Man, somebody is trying to kill this off. <laughs> but it's because I don't put money into that. Your money goes into the, the children. children. Yeah. And so I need somebody who is a green thumb, a master gardener, who would love to come and spend a couple hours a month on two flower beds in the front of agape just to look nice. Yeah. It's just little things that really make a big difference in agape. What's your, what's your website so we can go there and find you? Our website is www agape, A-G-A-P-E, you see it on the screen behind me, cares, C-A-R-E-S dot org, agape cares dot org. All right. Agape stands for unconditional love, and that's what you guys show to those kids, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it, Danny. Thanks. So we're going to take our collection right now, and a part of every dollar you ever give at Twickenham goes to, to Agape and to other organizations like that. So as we take our collection... Keep that in mind. We will sing as we do that. Brad? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. And I will fear no evil. And it 
a new series, The Problem. Here's what we're talking about in the most basic of terms. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Christians claim that an all-knowing, that God is all-knowing. Jesus himself said that when a sparrow falls, God knows it. And we believe that God is all-powerful. Jesus said that with God, all things are possible. And we claim that God is all-loving. And John wrote that God is Love And so if all that's true, then how is it that a man can walk into a Texas church and four minutes later, 26 people are dead? How is it that a man can bust out a hotel window in a Las Vegas hotel and kill 50? Why does a three-year-old girl, girl get cancer? Why, why does cancer ravage? Why do tsunamis wash away entire villages? A genuinely good guy that I went to college with died of a heart attack last week. Why? In the first lesson in this series, we did, we did a quick survey of how all the major religions in the world respond to the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. And all of them make some response, some more satisfying than others. But we pointed out that it's not just a problem for people who hold a religious belief system. Even people who do not believe in God have a problem with the problem of evil. If you missed it last week, and I know you guys were on retreat, so I want to encourage you to go online and look at that. You're going to encounter this question as you go through your educational career. We'd like very much for it not to be the first time you've heard it when you get to college or wherever you go. So go back and take a look at that and know that there are people that have some answers to these things. Basically, here's what we said last week. The, the problem of evil is a problem even for people who don't believe in God because if there is no God, there is no ultimate authority in the world. There is no absolute, categorical, 
universal standard. You and I are a bag of chemicals driven by evolutionary impulses seeking to survive, if not dominate. If there is no God, then this, this all that you see, is one big Nat Geo or animal planet episode. The strong eat the weak. Now, you, you can't say that government is the standard because we can all name governments that promoted injustice. And we don't even have to look outside our own borders. Slavery, Jim Crow, racial discrimination, abortion are just a few of the examples that, that, that we can name. You can't say that culture sets the standard. For years, the cultural thought leaders in our world told us through direct statements and artfully crafted stories and stirring cinematic productions that people ought to be able to pursue whatever made them feel happy and fulfilled, especially when it came to sex. And then people like Harvey Weinstein embraced that doctrine with gusto. And suddenly all those freedom preachers are looking for a new standard. If there is no God, there is no absolute authority. If there is no ultimate authority, there is no justification for outrage, no matter how viscerally evil, pain, and suffering offend us. To the very fact that skeptics object to evil, pain, and suffering undermines the basis of their argument against God. But you and I are probably not skeptics. If you're skeptical, I'm glad you're here. If you're an unbeliever, I'm really glad you're here. But most of us in the room are Christians. So when we make all those claims about God, he's all loving, he's all knowing, he's all caring, he's all powerful, then the problem becomes ours. We have to make a response to it. And so for this, you're going to have to put on your thinking caps. So I want you to sit up, take a deep breath, think with me. Let's take a look at how the classical argument that skeptics make and believers struggle with is framed when it's presented as a syllogism. A syllogism is a, log a logical argument that arrives at a conclusion based on two or more propositions that are assumed to be true. And about a third of us went, what? Right? And all the engineers went, right? So for all us non-engineers, okay, here's, here's what a syllogism looks like. Proposition one, all dogs have a keen sense of smell. Proposition two, Fido is a dog. Conclusion, Fido has a keen sense of smell. That's how a syllogism works. The way you have to deal with that is if, if you're going to deny that Fido has a keen sense of smell, you have to either prove that all dogs do not have a keen sense of smell or that Fido is not a dog. All right? So we do that kind of deductive reasoning all the time. So here's how the problem of, of evil looks when it's presented as a syllogism, all right? The problem of evil. A God who is all-powerful, all-good, and all-knowing would not permit evil to exist. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two, evil exists. Conclusion, therefore God, as we conceive of him, does not exist. The only way to get out of that is to deny either proposition number one or proposition number two. I don't know about you, but I don't really want to try to deny that evil exists. It's kind of hard to refute that. And based on what I read in Scripture, I don't want to deny that God is all-powerful, all-good, and all-knowing. So we have a problem. We have the problem of evil. For many years, Christian thinkers came up with a variety of responses to the logical problem of evil, and some of them were and still were, are quite good. But it wasn't until 1974 that this syllogism that you're looking at received a response that changed the equation. A Christian philosopher named Alvin Plantinga, he's still alive, actually won the Templeton Award uh, this year. A Alvin Plantinga added one little phrase. A God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good would not permit evil to exist unless he had a morally sufficient reason for doing so. Now, that may not hit you as all that revolutionary, but even leading skeptics admitted that Plantinga had, had flipped the script. Because now, instead of believers having to deny either one of God's divine attributes or the reality of evil, skeptics had to argue that a morally sufficient reason for permit, permitting evil could not possibly exist. So, let's ask that question. Is it remotely possible that a being possessed of power, knowledge, and love would have a morally sufficient reason to permit suffering? Can you even think of a situation where somebody with power and love and knowledge would permit somebody else to suffer and have a good reason for it? 
I can think of one. A few years ago, I knew a father who permitted his little son to be subjected to severe pain. In fact, the father held him down while another man snapped his arm, which sounds horrible, doesn't it? How could you do such a thing? Well, I was that father, and that little boy was my son, and the man who snapped his arm back into place was a doctor. My oldest son had fallen off a fence and broken his arm. Instead of one bend, his arm had two, the normal one at the elbow, and then another halfway between the elbow and the wrist right here. He had broken both the radius and the ulna. His arm went this way, then this way, then that way. The doctor gave him a shot to numb the pain before he reset the bone, but before he did, he looked at me and he said, Mr. Vickery, this is still going to hurt a lot. You might want to hold him down. So I leaned over my son, and I cradled him as tightly as I could, and I kept whispering in his ear, I got you, I got you, I got you, and then the doctor reset his bones, which made a crunching sound that I remember to this day. He screamed, and I cried. Resetting my son's broken bone was a morally sufficient reason to permit him to endure that suffering. A higher moral duty to restore the use of his right arm trumped the lesser duty of preventing pain. Plantinga's argument is that if God has a morally sufficient reason for allowing evil and suffering, then the existence of evil in the world does not contradict his power, knowledge, or love. So what could possibly be a morally sufficient reason? Well, for some of you guys, this is going to be really, really weird this next five minutes. For others of you, it won't be weird at all because you're weird. <laughs> In 1999, the Wachowski brothers wrote and produced a science fiction film called The Matrix. If you haven't seen it yet and you don't want a spoiler, Put your fingers in your ears and hum or something, all right? Because I'm going to blow it for you. It's called The Matrix. It starred Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne. Reeves plays a computer hacker named Neo, who, led by Fishburne's character Morpheus, discovers that, that all he imagines to be real is merely a computer-generated illusion created by machines who use human beings as energy sources in much the same way we use batteries. Told you it was weird, all right? The Matrix is an artificial world created by the machines to keep human beings docile and compliant. It's a world of pleasure and peace and prosperity. There are no struggles. There's no suffering. There's, there's no pain in the Matrix, but neither is there freedom. All decisions are predetermined. Every event, every action, every choice is programmed. The movie franchise tells the story of this group of humans who rebel against this artificial world and fight to reclaim their freedom, even though it means giving up their carefree lives. Now, if you could choose, which world would you live in? If you've seen the movie, which pill would you take, the red one or the blue one? Would you choose the matrix where you can live a carefree life without free will, or would you choose to live in the real world with all of its problems and pain and suffering, but where you would have the freedom to make your own choices? That's the question the movie explores. It's not really a new question. Plato wrote something called the Allegory of the Cave centuries ago, dives into some similar weirdness. But the question's even older than Plato. It was asked and answered before the creation of the world. God had a choice. God could have created a world in which his creatures would always make morally good choices and never make morally wrong choices. He could have wired us up to do the right thing and never do the wrong thing. He could have created us to be like robots capable of doing only the good he programmed us to do. You think about what that kind of world might look like. There'd be no crime because God would have programmed us to always be obedient to the law. But then there would be no law to obey because we would not need the restraints of legislation or the threat of punishment to control our programmed behavior. And if there are no laws, there would be no lawyers. <laughs> and no preachers. 
In such a world, there would be no violence, no war, no need for weapons, door locks, alarm systems, or anti-theft devices. You'd never have to guard your computer against malicious viruses or protect your passwords. Most of Huntsville would be out of a job since there would be no need for either offensive or defensive military. It would be completely impossible for any human being not just to ever do anything that was wrong, but to even think about doing something wrong. And in some ways that sounds absolutely marvelous, wonderful, perhaps even preferable to the world we live in. But if the will to choose had never been given, much of the world we know would never have existed. In such a world, there'd be no need for character education or moral training or learning right from wrong. Much, if not nearly all, of the work of parents, churches, and schools would be taken care of in our programming. The great works of literature, both fiction and nonfiction, that we've come to love would never have been produced since many of them deal with the moral and ethical tension between right and wrong, good and evil, wisdom and foolishness. I mean, imagine a Bible without Goliath, Ahab, or Herod, Jezebel, Rahab, or Sapphira. John Steinbeck could never have imagined the grapes of wrath or of mice and men. Shakespeare would never have dreamed up Macbeth. Hamlet would never have contemplated his existence. Harry Potter would never have faced he who must not be named. Without a wolf, there would have been no Little Red Riding Hood, no three little pigs, and no reason for the boy who cried wolf to cry. In such a world, there would be no redemption or rescue or mercy or grace or forgiveness, or reconciliation, because things like brokenness, sin, and moral failure would be unknown. There would be no songs of praise, no prayers for rescue, no celebrations for deliverance, because we would never have known what it was to be lost, enslaved, or imprisoned. There would be no call for worship, no expressions of gratitude, and no reason to rejoice, but because we would never have known need or sorrow or struggle. Concepts like faithfulness and loyalty and fidelity and commitment would be meaningless because there would be nothing to tempt us to betrayal or duplicity or dishonesty or corruption. Had God chosen to create human beings without morally significant free will, there would be no suffering or pain or evil. We would live in complete and total obedience to his will, not because we loved him and chose to obey, but because he forced us. Our relationship to God would lack all integrity, if you could call it a relationship at all. We don't really relate to machines, we use them. And that's not what God wanted when he created the world. C.S. Lewis reasoned that an omnipotent God could prevent evil, but he could only do it at the cost of human freedom. And that's not the kind of world God created. He created us free in the most robust sense of that term. We may choose to love him or just merely like him or hate him. We may believe he, he exists and live like it or believe that he exists and live like he doesn't or reject him altogether. Our freedom to choose is just one morally sufficient reason for God to permit the existence of evil in our world. Giving us free will was a higher moral duty than dropping us into a matrix-like world where all the outcomes are already determined. So the astute sermon listener is already thinking, okay, I get that, but that really doesn't explain Tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and disease and tsunamis and blizzards, those aren't our fault. You're right, mostly. Those are examples of what philosophers call natural evil, and we'll talk about those next week. Until then, I want you to think about this. If God miraculously eliminated all the evil in the world, if he called forth some prophet who, to, to hold out his staff the way Moses did in the book of Exodus and all the evil and pain and suffering in the world was rolled back like the Red Sea. If God announced 
an international day of amnesty where all the consequences of all our sinful choices would suddenly be rescinded. Within 24 hours, we'd be right back where we started. Somebody would celebrate the death of evil by drinking too much, and they'd climb behind the wheel, and they'd drive north in a southbound lane and kill a family of five. And somebody else would fire a gun recklessly or in anger. A lobbyist would offer a bribe and a politician would take it. A man with too much time on his hands and unresolved anger at his wife would type some lurid word into his computer's search engine. A boy and a girl with too little accountability would go further than they should. Within a year or so, there'd be another genocide another terrorist attack, another mass shooting. And before you know it, we'd be asking, why does God allow so much suffering? Honestly, sometimes I wonder if God doesn't want to ask us exactly the same question. He created us with freedom to choose. And from the beginning, we chose badly. The good news is God had a plan for that even before the beginning. The plan is called the gospel, and the hero of the gospel is Jesus. Because in the world that God created, there were crosses, and Jesus hung on one for you, for me. And because of that, we can be made right, even after all the wrong we have done, no matter how much it is. Amen. That's good news. Let's stand together. Let's sing. See you next week. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, Our God is an awesome God. He reigns, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, with wisdom power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. for being here this morning. Uh, Jody, thanks for that message. Brad, thanks for leading worship. Just a couple of quick announcements as we close. This upcoming Saturday, November 18th, is our second harvest where we'll feed uh, probably 150 to 170 families. Uh, if you have taken uh, some of the bags that have been available and haven't brought those back, we would ask that you get those back in by Tuesday when we'll start uh, doing an inventory and making sure that we have enough for Saturday. If you're interested in helping on Saturday, give the office a call. Uh, if you're wondering what in the world would I do, uh, there's a ton of jobs that you can help with on that Saturday morning that range from carrying groceries out to just sitting down eating pancakes. Uh, you can't get much better deal than that just to come eat pancakes and share with some of the families that will be here. Also, uh, let me announce that uh, there is no spring tonight. Uh, Lincoln is out of town, so we'll not have that. I do want to call your attention, though, to an announcement in your bulletin uh, for Wednesday nights in December when we will have what we call dessert and Devo. Uh, we'll have a dessert between 6 and 6.30, uh, and then a period of, of worship led by Lincoln and the praise team, and uh, a message from Jody on a series titled An Unexpected Christmas. So I'd invite you to Get that on your calendars December 6th, 13th, and 20th, and come be a part of that. Uh, also, one more thing, December 3rd, we'll have a new member lunch. Uh, if you're interested in placing membership, Jody alluded to this earlier this morning, and want to be a part of that or want more information on Twickenham, please uh, see me, see one of our elders, uh, and we can give you more information on that. If you'll stay standing, Mark Bill's going to come uh, and lead us in a closing prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for such a beautiful morning. Thank you for the time we've had to come and sit side by side with each other, to laugh with each other, to cry with each other, to study, uh, to meditate 
uh, to, to meet around your table and to remember the most incredible gift the world has ever seen. Be with us, Father, as we leave here this morning. Walk with us, care for us, forgive us when we do wrong. Uh, it is in your Son's name that we pray. Amen.